Good morning and welcome. It is my pleasure to be able to tell you a little bit about my research on Baroque improvisation, a topic I have been interested in since I have been playing the organ. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the role of memorized patterns in Baroque improvisation using the analogy of spoken rhetoric to help clarify how Baroque improvisation works. I will start with an overview of improvisational practices in the 18th century. Also, in my choral improvisations, I will show examples of a few different choral-based genres. In recent years, people have been become increasingly interested in historical improvisational techniques, in part because of increased interest in historically informed performance practice. The study of Baroque improvisation also offers us a historical understanding of music theory, which is absent from much music theory education today. I believe that historical improvisation bridges the gap between the two extremes of classical music education, music theory curriculum, which is often overly analytical and removed from real music making, and at the other extreme, performance education, which often emphasizes technical athleticism at the expense of musical understanding. Improvisation necessarily involves the simultaneous use of music theory principles and performance techniques. From the mid 16th till the 18th centuries, rhetoric was central to education across Europe and particularly in Germany. Schoolboys memorized multiplication tables for mathematics, grammatical rules for Latin, and rhetoric figures for speech and writing. Musicians memorized diminution patterns, musical schemes, and ornaments that they could use to compose and improvise music. In the Lutheran tradition, the musical rhetorical system was infused with the Lutheran chorales. My study explores the relationship between improvised spontaneity and memorized patterns in choral-based organ improvisations in the Lutheran tradition. When I describe musical schemes, I will be using quintillion rhetoric terms. I call memorized patterns on the structural level disposizio, on the harmonic and contrapuntal level elaboratio, and on the musical surf surface decoratio. Improvisational learning consists of two phases, assimilation and execution. During the assimilation phase, an improviser enriches his musical language with dispositio, elaboratio, and decoratio patterns. During execution, the learned idiom becomes an intelligible musical utterance, and it is when inventio, and elocutio, two other terms of classical rhetoric, becomes relevant. The concept of musical schemata, devised by Robert Jördigen, is key to our understanding of improvised music in the 18th century. On your handout, you can see a visual representation of the so-called Doremi schema. Recognizing such schemata is an essential skill in harmonizing melodies and improvising choral credits. One of the most popular Lutheran chorales in the 18th century, Freud is Ser or Meine Seele, consists mostly of scalar motions. In, in the beginning of the chorale, you can easily detect the Doremi scheme. An 18th century organist would instantly recognize such schemes in any choral melody. In his Grosse Generalsbachschule, Johann Matheson describes an audition for the prestigious organist position at the Hamburg Cathedral in 1724. The audition consisted of six improvisatory tasks, which included the following. Number one, 
to improvise a prelude at the moment, nothing previously studied, which can be detected at once. This fourth spiel begin in A major and end in G minor and last for approximately two minutes. Number two, to improvise no longer than six minutes on the chorale, Herr Jesu Christ, du hörst dir gut. The improvisation should specifically use two manuals with the pedal in a pure three-voice harmony without doubling the bass so that the feet do not know what the hands are doing, yet that each voice sounds optimal with the other voices. Improvisation was crucial for garnering a Lutheran church position in the 18th century. The ideal candidate for the Hamburg position would be not only a, an accomplished organist, but also a consum consummate musician or musicus, intimately familiar with the red theory and practice of the common musical style of his time. Only a musicus would be able to execute these improvisational challenges. In 1787, Daniel Gottlob Türk compares improvised choral prose to sermons. A good sermon is prepared but not written. Similarly, an improvised choral prelude is success successful when, quote, one is led to believe the prelude has been composed beforehand, end quote. I will now ask Professor Holzer to select a hymn before, uh, from before 1750 for my presentation. While Mr. Holzer selects the hymn, <laughs> I will read Turk's outline of a choral prelude. And you can read it on your handout as well. First, one selects a melodic idea that simultaneously will serve as the introduction. After this theme has been developed for a while, together with a few short interludes, one plays the first line of the choral melody quite slowly on a different, more fully registered manual. Uh, this is called the Cantus Firmus section, by the way. Meanwhile, the melodic idea, or at least something similar to it, is continued in the accompanying voice. This is again followed by the shorter interlude, then by the second line of the melody, and so on. Oh, thank you. In the introduction, in the introduction, I will play the Cantus Firmus on the two-foot nachthorn in the pedal. Listen carefully how the pedal plays the top voice. After the introduction, Audrey Fernandez Fraser will join me in singing the first verse of the hymn. And after that, I will harmonize the hymn in the soprano, tenor, and bass voices. What's the hymn? The hymn is um, not very known. Ich freue mich in den Herrn. Could you play it? Yes. 